on here. Can you hear me and see me okay? Uh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Cool. How are you, man? Good to meet you face to face. Good. Good. Yeah. Great to meet you. It's about time. Yeah, I know, right? Uh, where you're in New York, right? Yeah, New York. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I got you. Um, yeah. So I appreciate you taking the time, man. Um, this is this is something that I've been mulling over in my head for at least the last three <laughs> years or so, um, and it's one of those rare topics that even now I feel like I don't have like a really clear answer on. And um, even when, you know, I, I'll scroll social media or whatever, I still see from people that I consider to be, you know, qualified, smart people saying conflicting things about this topic. Yeah. Um, so I guess just to like very briefly get you up to speed and anyone listening up to speed, um, I'm working on this video where I want to correct or at least get more right things that I've said uh, on the channel over the last four or five years. Um, so I've got like five different topics and I'm speaking to, you know, various different experts helping me kind of course correct or what have you. Um, one of those topics is kind of double sided. One side is does dietary cholesterol impact blood cholesterol? And then the other side of that is are there consequences as a result of that impact on um, risk of cardiovascular disease? Um, so I actually never really ever, to my knowledge, addressed the, the second side of that on the channel. Um, one thing that I did say in a vlog once was um, dietary cholesterol doesn't impact blood cholesterol that much. So that's the exact quote. Um, that turned out to be more controversial than I would have expected <laughs> um, in, in, in the online space. And uh, I think I would walk that back nowadays or at least update it to say, I, I mean, I suppose it depends on what I meant by that much, but I think the implication was I was having a, a meal of a couple eggs and I was like, okay, you guys don't really need to worry about this too much. I think I think that's what people would walk away with, with that or from that with. Um, I think nowadays I would say something more like, uh, Dietary cholesterol doesn't impact blood cholesterol at a certain point. So if you have low blood cholesterol, then dietary cholesterol will have a meaningful impact on your blood cholesterol levels. Uh, however, if you have a certain level of blood cholesterol, then increasing dietary cholesterol probably won't have an impact. Um, so that's what I'd say about the first one. The second one, I'm actually still quite torn on. Um, but I lean m more even now as we speak, probably in the direction of dietary cholesterol not being a major nutrient of concern insofar as uh, cardiovascular disease risk is concerned. Um, so I'm totally open to changing my mind on that. I'd love to hear you know what you have to say about those two questions. Um, but that's basically what I'd like to focus on. So I guess sure. we can start with start with the first one and and you can mm -hmm. you know have your say about what I just updated it to and if you feel like that needs further updating and then we can move on to the the second side. Sure. A lot of this is going to depend on what you mean by major and what you mean by that much. So you in, in the positions you've put forward you you've given yourself a little bit of uh, wiggle room here. Right. Uh, inherently whether that's I'm not saying that's intentional but I think it's better to be as precise, just as people go, well, what does he mean by major? It's not a major concern. Okay, well, is it a moderate concern? Okay, well, so there's a lot of confusion on this topic. Uh, there's a lot of confusion on this topic by very smart people and very smart people who have studied nutrition for a long time. It's not really their fault. There's been... There's been conflicting data. There's been conflicting meta-analyses, uh, not of prospective cohort studies, but of randomized controlled trials. And there's there, as you mentioned, there's this idea. It's, it originated, as far as I know, in 1992 by Hopkins, who performed a meta-analysis based on um, baseline dietary cholesterol consumption. Uh, I don't believe it was based on serum cholesterol i'd have to recheck that but a base but the idea is maybe that you would go hand in hand and you you do see this he's found this u-shaped curve this this hyperbolic curve so and that the idea is that would explain why so many meta-analyses didn't find a result other meta-analyses or publications did find a result 
it's just you're going to find a result or not depending on where you are on the side of the dietary cholesterol curve if you're high on it you're going to have to have an enormous amount of power to see some sort of difference if you're low on it you're not because you're kind of that's the way high probably you'll get the most bang for your buck at the uh at the origin of the axis um the thing to keep in mind though is that if this is true um we'll get to whether that's true or not we'll get to um the explanations for for why there uh is a relationship the way it is why it may, why it's not linear if it's true um it, the idea is that it, the re things these things usually tend to be symmetrical um in the sense of increasing versus decreasing so if you have someone with the goal of decreasing their ldl cholesterol and they're currently consuming 500 1000 milligrams of dietary cholesterol a day if they're going to say all right you know what i'm going to cut back to 200 uh, i'm going to cut back by 250 milligrams that's probably not going to do much of anything they're not going to see they're probably not going to see much decrease in their uh ldl and if they are it's probably not because of the decrease in dietary cholesterol it's probably because of other things that come with that such as well that food sources are rich in dietary cholesterol just so also happen to be uh have a tendency to be rich in saturated fat and if you're reducing that you're by proxy reducing saturated fat and then that was what's going to be driving that's going to have the impact however if this person says you know what i want every i, I want to make everything optimal i want to i want to really reduce my risk i'm going to, i'm willing to go to zero or or close to zero that will have a impact um and and not an inconsequential one it's not i wouldn't say it's the most major thing in terms of cardiovascular risk um but i don't think it's going to be inconsequential either uh but you do have to get close to the origin because of the way the curve is. What really settled this dispute over people arguing over whether there is a relationship or not, to, to answer the first question, is a meta-regression analysis by uh, Vincent and Mackey and published in 2019, I believe it was. Um, I don't know, are you familiar with that paper? Have you seen it? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, I'm not. I'm writing it down now. I'll, okay, I'll sure. definitely look that one yeah. up. Yeah. I think yeah, actually also, you might. I think you mentioned it to me actually when we did the brief call before this one. But outside of that, no, because I haven't. Other than uh, just casual consumption on like social media and that kind of thing, I haven't really dug into this in a while. Uh, sure. So I think the the latest papers I would have looked at uh, would have been like meta analyses from I want to say like 2016, 2017, something like that. Okay. Um, so anything past that, I I. I don't think I'd be super familiar with. Gotcha, so, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay, but go, continue. That's great. So yeah, t t just finishing up the 2016, 2017 ones um, or ones that came before that. Uh, one one uh, funny one to me was a meta analysis which finds that, okay, yes, it increases LDL, uh, but the LDL to HDL ratio uh, hasn't really changed. That's, that's always a, a comedic one to me. I was gonna pull. Uh, I was gonna pull. I was gonna pull that on you, but not yeah. trying to be comedic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Um, the, the reason that's comedic to me is because um, we know from uh, not not only uh, Mendelian randomization studies and uh, all sorts of interventions we've had on HDL is that it's non it's a uh, uh, it's non causal. It's not a therapeutic target. So what would HDL, it, it mark, it's a marker of risk. It's not a maker of risk. So when you have a high HDL, that's a good predictor of a, of a protective effect. When you have a low HDL, that's a good predictor of, a, um, uh, of an atherogenic effect. But what that doesn't mean is that increasing your HDL by just pumped your blood full of HDL particles, it doesn't mean that that's going to improve your risk. 
Mm. That's interesting. That's I, that, yeah. That, yeah, that sounds counterintuitive to me, though, because um, I think one of the arguments for increasing, say, uh, your amount of exercise is that it increases HDL particles. And then mechanistically, um, I, I, you know, not my area. So if I stumble, let me yeah. know. But I, 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 my understanding is that the HDL particles are responsible for sort of shuttling cholesterol out of the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. And the LDL ones are sort of the ones that pack cholesterol yeah. in the bloodstream. So it, it seems like there's a me causal mechanism there. I mean, like increasing HDL alongside, HD, or, or alongside LDL should result mm -hmm. in, you know, not a... Uh, an, an increased level of uh, cholesterol concentration in the blood, right? I mean, it kind of makes it does. sense to me. You, you, you would think, you would think, and look, a lot of people would think that's why this got published. Right. Um, but it turns out that's not true. Um, and so just to, so I'll make a couple of points to that. So first of all, I can give you mechanistic intuitions as to why that doesn't pan out. But even if I was not able to do that, it wouldn't mean that we should believe that. And the reason for that is because the outcomes that are studied in the trials trump the mechanisms. When we look at therapeutic interventions that have tried to raise HDL, this has been studied. Um, people have, the cardiology community has tried to do all sorts of interventions to bump up HDL, to decrease the risk. They've tried to use this as a therapeutic target. Uh, they've all failed. Um, it, it's, it's, and that therapeutic target has been abandoned by the cardiology community at this point. Um, it's been accepted to be a, a make a marker reverse, but not a maker reverse. Now, what's the intuition pump here? Okay, so you're not going to be satisfied by just saying, and even though you should, and you should back off it just with that alone. But the idea might one possibility is that what's what's happening is you're increasing the concentration of HDL particles, but that doesn't mean that if the concentration of HDL particles are increased, that the same amount of um, lipid is going to be removed from the arteries. It could be that uh, smaller amounts of HDL um, uh, just happen to remove larger amounts of lipid from the arteries. And as HDL concentration goes up, each HDL particle removes less and less. And so on the net, you end up with the same. Is that true? Is that not true? I don't know. Um, and then there may just be some other factor uh, such that when you, someone just starts off with a high amount of HDL, high concentration, that their HDL particles, their activity, their functionality is really what's driving it. And that and they just have a better HDL functionality rather than, um, rather, and that's what's driving the decreased risk as opposed to the decreased risk being driven by the concentration itself. Okay. So that's one mechanistic way you can, might understand it. But regardless of whether that's right or wrong, the point is it's been tried, it's been tested, it's, um, it's failed. Right. Consistent. Yeah, no, that, that point is taken fine enough. Um, I believe that the American Heart Association still cites an HDL increase as a rationale for increasing exercise. Now, increasing exercise might be a good idea for lowering blood cholesterol for all sorts of other reasons. Um, but, it, you know, just on my scan of mm -hmm. the info, like mainstream yeah. info on this, I haven't really seen your point of view come through a whole lot. Um, well, well, let me just stop you right there because so increasing, so I, I just want to be clear. So increasing HDL is, I'm not saying that's, uh, um, not necessarily a good or bad thing. I'm not saying it's like a, it's not necessarily a good thing. It's just that it's a good thing because it happens to be correlated with things that are associated with an increase. Now it, the American Heart Association is not saying that exercise is good because it increases HDL. And the reason that's good, the reason increasing HDL is good is because if you therapeutically target HDL, it will it will decrease your risk of, uh, of atherosclerosis. That's not what they're saying. Right. And it might be easy for people to get confused there. Um, a better, a, a more defensible statement would be, okay, well, ex one of the reasons exercise is good is that it increased HDL. And HDL may just happen to be correlated with good signs of good health, and what do you know, when someone exercises, they happen to have signs of good health, mm -hmm. um, predictors of, of markers of good health. That's not surprising, mm -hmm. right? But, but that's going to be very different than a therapeutic tar target approach. Um, mm. That's the kind of thing that's been consistently failed. Yeah, I don't. I don't want to get too off track here because we're still. Uh, sure. I still want to hit the hit yeah, the main yeah. point. But I, mm -hmm. I think even just going back to that meta analysis, the the older one that mm -hmm. you had that I was going to bring up. Um, with the ratio not really changing, mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. I'm not sure if they're necessarily implying in that paper that the intention is to use HDL as a therapeutic target. It's just merely an observation mm -hmm. that both particle types tend to increase in unison, meaning the ratio doesn't actually change, which as you've said yourself, yeah. is actually correlated with better outcomes. So I think it's more so used just to point out that it isn't really a one-sided thing. It's like, well, HDL being higher equals good. You know, I mean, it, it's at least better than just seeing like a one-sided increase in, in LDL. Not necessarily. Right? So, it doesn't, it doesn't okay. equal. Well, that's the thing. That's, that's the important right. point. The point is that HDL equals higher doesn't necessarily equal equal a right. good it's just pro a correlation. Tanto puzzle thing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. that's not the same thing with LDL. That's the point. Okay. With LD, the point is that they're not symmetric on the that the, you're taking a ratio of two things that are not symmetric in terms of the outcome. One it, increase in LDL, all other things being considered, that is not good. Right. Right. Okay. HDL increasing, all other things being considered, that's not necessarily uh, good or bad at all. That that could be just non causal. Right. right. That's that's the key point. And so if you're if you have some intervention that increases something that we know is that all else equal is causally harmful and then something else that that's increasing that is not in and it of itself causally beneficial, but it's correlated with certain things what is beneficial that that's that's important to mention. Right. right? No, that, that makes sense. sense. That makes sense. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to uh, the first question. Oh, before we do, is, before yeah. we go back, before we go back, I'm so sorry. To, the, the other thing is, the other thing is, um, the other point to make there is that even even with that argument, um, the if you actually calculate out the the ratios, um, and and you and and you, you do the same type of analysis, uh, you do see a worsening of the ratio as well. Um, mm. But it's just not nearly as bad. It's it's not it's not as bad. It doesn't change. It doesn't change that much. But right. uh, the direction is still in the un, unfavorable direction. But I wouldn't even make that argument because I don't think it needs to be made. So, so you're saying like the the main factor of concern is an increase in LDL concentration, basically. In terms Let's, of in terms of dietary cholesterol yeah. uh, as as right. the intervention. Yeah. 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 As far. Okay. So the, the yeah. If if dietary cholesterol increases blood cholesterol, we're talking about LDL here. And if HDL mm -hmm. just so happens to rise along with it, you're saying that that wouldn't override the negative impact that an increase in LDL would have. That's right. If you're going to yeah. maintain the same ratio and you're going to increase LDL and increase HDL, I would view I would not view that as a good thing. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. All right. Um, so yeah, let's, let's go back to, uh, the, the broader question. Does dietary cholesterol increase the blood cholesterol? Um, it seems like you agree with me, right? It's there's, there's an increase if your levels are low and if your levels are high, then there's not much of an increase, right? That's, that was kind of the so mathematical it's relationship. A little you more, described. It's a little more, it, that, that is a hypothesis that I will tell you that, that there is debate over exactly what the nature of the uh, uh, relationship is. Some people say that it's not necessarily about the blood cholesterol. It's about the baseline dietary cholesterol, because that might um, that might have a stronger impact on certain transporters um, uh, in the in the gut that is responsible for absorbing dietary cholesterol rather than uh, blood cholesterol itself. Some people argue, no, it's more about the blood cholesterol. And some people say that it's not about either of those things. There's just some unknown factor. And they point to the fact that in Maki's uh, meta-regression, um, that factors such as blood cholesterol or dietary cholesterol uh, didn't improve the nonlinear model. Now, the response to that is that, well, the reason it didn't improve the nonlinear model is because the nonlinear model is just proxying a change in dietary cholesterol, which proxies the uh, baseline dietary cholesterol or blood cholesterol well enough to begin with, and you need an enormous amount of power to do that. Who's right? I don't know. I don't know who's right, but but everyone is agreeing. Everyone on the, all three of those sides of the debate, they agree that there is a relationship, that dietary cholesterol increases blood cholesterol. That's not in dispute. What's in dispute is the exact type of relationship, the nature of that relationship, why uh, it's not linear. Most people at this point agree that there is a relationship, that the relationship is nonlinear, um, and there is such dispute over why that is. Right. Just so people can follow, the, the nonlinear relationship looks asymptotic, right? So it's like there, there, it starts kind of linear where, the, you know, you increase dietary cholesterol, you see kind of a 
dose response increase in blood cholesterol along with that. And then at a certain point, it starts to level off. So you can increase a, your, your dietary cholesterol quite a lot, but you don't see much of an increase anymore uh, in, in the blood cholesterol, right? So that's what you mean by nonlinear. Right. If it was perfectly yeah. linear, it would just continue to increase uh, alongside one another all the way up. Um, so, I mean, yeah, that, that, that sounds good. I mean, like there sounds to be like there's some disagreement about it, but I think that that pretty accurately captures maybe what something resembling a consensus would be uh, if your baseline serum cholesterol levels are low, you're going to see a bigger increase. If they're high, you're not going to see as much of an increase. That's pretty, that's like the simple takeaway, right? Um, okay, so then let's move on to uh, the second side, because I think that that's actually more interesting. That's what people care about. Sure. I think like yeah. the first point is kind of just a technical point, and it's like, okay, what's the implication of this, right? So if it turned out that it was true that dietary cholesterol didn't impact blood cholesterol that much or at all, then who cares? Just go to town with the eggs and you'll be fine, right? Because there's nothing, right. well, not, not necessarily, right. but insofar as cholesterol is concerned, that would be true. Um, but if there, there is a relationship, then okay, well now maybe we need to worry about what the impact of increasing blood cholesterol is on your risk of getting heart disease. Um, so that's where the rubber hits the road. And I think that's, that's what I'm more interested in, even though to be fair, it's not really an area of focus for me. I'm more interested in like the bodybuilding style research, but I think, right, right, the, right. The, but these things do overlap when you have bodybuilders eating like 12 eggs a day and, and stuff. So it's yeah. worth considering. Yeah. <laughs> so in the, in the Maki's uh, meta regression, when they looked at the effect size, uh, the linear model uh, predicted, uh, I believe it was one point something, uh, an increase per every, um, I think it's in milligrams per deciliter per every, uh, 100 milligrams of uh, dietary cholesterol. But again, the linear model was less accurate. And so the nonlinear models, that was around four and change, four, around four point something milligrams per deciliter per every 100. Now, that was the mean amount. That's actually, you have to factor that in with the asymptotic relationship. So I think where people uh, converge around is that if you, if you go, off from all the way up to all the way down, you get around, I think you can expect to have around maybe 15 or so milligrams uh, per deciliter, uh, maybe even 20 uh, of a decrease in LDL cholesterol. Uh, you, you might be able to get there. Um, can I interrupt you just for a second? Sure. So, um, cause I, I know that like, this mm -hmm. is not just for me. So uh, mm -hmm. what, so what is a, let's say a typical Western baseline cholesterol concentration in uh, the units you're using. And it, just so people have like some reference point about like, what would be like a normal number? Cause you're talking about like, I think, what did you say? A 12 to 15 mm -hmm. uh, nanogram per deciliter yeah. decrease. Like what is that relative to, are we looking at like 200? So the normal range, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the, the normal is typically considered to be less than a hundred milligrams per deciliter. That's normal? Less than 100? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now, some people say that an ideal LDL cholesterol should be less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. Less than 100 nanograms per deciliter is... is no, no, no. Mil milligram, milligram. Oh, a milligram. Sorry. Sorry. I, I may have misspoken. Um, yeah, mil milligrams. Per I don't think you misspoke. I just heard it wrong. Um, and le less than 70 would be some, some would people, say yeah, would be some ideal. Say it's so it's less ideal, than a hundred. Yeah. That sounds low to me for, I, I could be wrong, but to, for like a typical, it's not like for American total cholesterol, it's for LDL. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. For, yeah to be clear, we're not, I'm not t total. This is for LDL specifically, not total. Oh, cholesterol. I see. Okay. All right. All right. Um, for total cholesterol, they say some say less than 200 milligrams per deciliter. Okay. So we're looking at something in the ballpark of, uh, around a hundred milligrams per deciliter for, uh, LDL specifically as like, you know, mm -hmm. a ballpark figure. And, uh, when it comes to daily intake of cholesterol in milligrams, what mm -hmm. is average? Is it like 200, 400, you know, a, a thousand would I think be it's high. Around 350 last I checked in the USA. Um, right. let me see, or maybe 300. Oh, okay. About 300. 300, uh, 300, mil uh, 300 milligrams 300 per day through diet. Okay. Just, just so these numbers make sense in people's heads. Yeah. 
And so the mean, the, they, the mean was for, let's see. So just like doing some quick calculations, just to say like, okay, well, if you take an average person and you reduce them to zero, um, it's like four and a, four and a half milligrams per deciliter per hundred. So 4.5 times three, if you just do the mean, there's going to be other considerations, but that gets me just the back of the envelope calculation gets me to 13.5 milligrams per deciliter of a difference. Right. Um, yeah. So, uh, you know, people can, uh, so does, is that the, you know, the most major impactful thing? And it's not, it's certainly not more important than saturated fat. Um, is it me? Is it inconsequential? No, definitely not. Um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll put I'll push back a little bit on that, sure. um, because I I, I would say I, I would probably say I think it kind of is, but it, in in my case and in the case of most people in my yeah. audience who are um, generally healthy, so assuming they follow the things that I say, okay, mm -hmm. they're 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 yeah. generally healthy. I obviously I can't assume they have good genetics, but let's just say average, um, mm -hmm. or we can ignore genetics. Uh, they exercise regularly three to five days a week, including weight training, um, mm -hmm. probably non-smokers. I generally encourage, you know, a, a, a reasonably high, uh, fruit and, and vegetable intake. So like a, you know, a good solid amount of fiber intake. Um, mm -hmm. I think that like those, and, and then being young, you know, most people in my audience are in the range mm -hmm. of like 20 to 35, something like that. Uh, like, I think that those factors would outweigh a whatever 10 to 12, yeah. milligram per deciliter yeah, they, they may, increase they may, or decrease they may, but you know? that's but wait but but notice how that doesn't mean that it's not in, it's inconsequential uh so the, you you pointing out that there are other factors that may uh outweigh um a, some more minor factor um that doesn't in any way make the minor factor uh meaningless it just means that you can make certain choices and based on your values and you can say okay well um my baseline risk is low enough as it is because of all these other factors. So maybe this factor isn't as important uh, or maybe this is just some uh, I'm ignoring this more minor factor because I have all these more major factors on my side. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm OK with the increased risk from the minor factor because of uh, how much I push my baseline risk down. That that's a more defensible position. What's not defensible is to say, well, uh, I've, I have all the more important factors, and so this minor factor is just going to make no difference at all. It's like a zero. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's indefensible it's because it, it's still conceivable that, you, you, you know, you could have a case where that change in concentration is actually only impactful for an individual who doesn't have the other factors. So it's possible that, like, the other factors could sort of trump the, the, the cholesterol like that factor. It doesn't Right. Okay, it looks fair. like for yeah. So so if and we can I can send you that even if in low risk patients, um, and this is done through uh, various uh, randomized controlled trials with certain cholesterol targeting uh, LDL targeting medications with statins and whatnot. Um, the real consensus among uh, cardiologists at this point is the lower the better. Um, now the the decrease, the further decrease, uh, you know, is going to get lower and lower as the baseline risk approaches zero. Of course, there's not much more room to benefit. But uh, even among uh, low risk stratified populations uh, who have done diabetes, who don't, uh, who, who don't, I have to look through all the, all the particular things that they were uh, using to proxy for good health. But even among the most healthy, um, you still had uh, significant findings for, um, for decreasing uh, concentration of LDL even further. And I, I, every how, how, how would they study that? Is this yeah, like ahead. interventional research or because, you know, if they're young people, sure. presumably you wouldn't be able to follow them across a, a reasonable enough time frame to be able to assess, you know, that sort of risk. So, I mean, it just seems so like. So you can and and they have. So they, they've done, um, a no, there's a, no, a lot of uh, randomized controlled trials with therapeutic targets for LDL cholesterol. In, in young healthy subjects? For primary prevention, I have to look at the exact ages, but they can stratify. There's there are thousands and thousands. I know, I know. I'm aware. I'm aware that there's a lot of of data on this for yeah. sure. Um, but what they've done like is the point. I, I, again, I, I'm kind of arguing for a straw man here. I, well, let I'm me not, just ask you. Let me just ask you yeah, the question go ahead. first. So, go ahead. so, so, so uh, what they've done is they say, okay, well, let's let's make a risk stratification. Let's say, okay, so there's going to be a whole bunch of people. There's people who are more healthy. There's people who are less healthy. Let's just take, 
let's stratify them based on some risk metric and let's look at the lowest risk one and say, okay, these people we have reason to believe are the are of the healthiest tiers of the people that are being studied. Do we still see a benefit by decreasing LDL cholesterol? And the answer is yes. You see the benefit uh, across the entire uh, across the entire risk stratification. What is what now, is maybe, the benefit? What is the benefit? What ben what's the benefit? Yeah, yeah. So the benefit is decrease in uh, cardiovascular events. So and the heart attacks, strokes. Um, yeah. It seems unlikely and, that someone in that group, that stratified group, would experience those events. I mean, you need to have so many subjects in order to detect those yeah. actual events and yeah. then to reach significance. And then you're saying that that That's happens. That's right. That has happened. Yes, they, they reach significance. I, I, um, and now, now, to be fair, and I'll send it, but, but now to be fair, it, it's a significance on a relative risk metric. Obviously, the absolute risk is going to be uh, low because the baseline risk is low to begin with. But on meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials, looking at the, these therapeutic targets, they do find that, okay, well, we, there is a lot of power to this because there's been a lot of data on this. There's been a lot of data at the highest levels of the, uh, the evidence hierarchy, and you do find it. So right. Statistically significant findings, on, even on the, uh, the lowest risk. So the point I, I would make is that based on what we know from the data at this point is like the, the defensible position here is to say, okay, if I have every, like if someone wants to eat eggs, if someone wants to say uh, from a health defense, the, I'm giving you the most defensible argument, right? The most defensible argument is to say, okay, look, um, I am consuming dietary cholesterol. That is going to have some impact on my serum cholesterol uh, compared to if I ate zero of it. That has some impact on risk, but by means of LDL. However, I have so many other things optimized that my baseline risk is so low to begin with that this difference is a absolute risk difference that I'm okay with. And considering all the other things for me, that's pro that's the most defensible thing someone can say. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, and it's not insane. It's not crazy. Um, that's, that's a defensible argument. What I don't think is consistent with the data is to say, well, because I'm so optimized, and because I'm so Chad, and look at, <laughs> um, and I look at, and I, 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 you know, even my dietary cholesterol is from grilled chicken, and you know, so, and and I mix it with broccoli, so <laughs> because of that, the dietary cholesterol has zero impact hmm. on my on, on my on my risk. Like that's like, like okay, well, come on, like if you think that, then what you're saying is that. And at, because of your low concentration of LDL to begin with, and because of your all these health factors, uh, what's happening is that in increasing your LDL is not going to make any difference. Now, that's mm -hmm. not only been studied, and um, and it doesn't seem consistent with the randomized control trial of control trials of um, with with RCTs of uh, risk stratific stratified patients. Um, even on some even on some observational studies that really risk stratify based on even HDL and tri triglycerides, the L the uh, the LMHRs as, as 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 you may have heard, even that doesn't seem consistent. So I, I don't think that's a, a defensible position. Now, right. am I saying that you need to eat the other? Am I saying you need to avoid eggs to be healthy? Like, no, that's not that's not what's being said either. Yeah, you don't need to avoid dietary cholesterol to be healthy. Um, but what, but, and this is the important, but, um, the fact that you don't need to avoid dietary cholesterol to be healthy does not mean that it's an inconsequential factor in being healthy. Yeah, I, I would, I'm, I'm open to changing my mind on this. And I, I, if, you know, if you send me the, the, the studies and so on and so forth, I'm totally, of course, open to that because it's, it's not much to, uh, you know, Say okay, there's there's a there's a small risk here, but it's a risk I'm willing to take on because I like eggs, and my risk is already so low of developing heart mm -hmm. disease in my life, given you know genetic factors and lifestyle factors, that it's a risk I'm I'm more than comfortable yeah. taking, and and that that's I think the position I would hold if I were to update it. What I'm still mm -hmm. kind of leaning towards, and the, the reason for this is just that uh, I'm speaking to you one on one. If I had other people who are smart about cholesterol on, there would be people who I think would disagree with you on this. Maybe you think I'm wrong about that, but send them over to me. Okay, sure. I, I mean, yeah, we can do. I, it's not. It's not my point to try to prove <laughs> you wrong, but I. I think you could. I think you could make the case 
that uh, the the increase in risk in this you know younger, healthier population is so infinitesimally small that you might as well call it zero when communicating with the public. That's that's okay, what I would well, say. That's a different. Okay, so that's a different claim. So that's going to be rem- okay. So that's going to be some he- some hedging because like that's going to depend on what you consider quantitatively what you consider an infinitesimally small risk such that you can call it zero. So I, what I definitely don't think is defensible is to say it's literally zero. Right. That's I don't, I don't good. believe that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and regards to the question of what you consider uh, small enough to just round it to zero, that's going to depend on what that number is for you. And also uh, I would ask just to apply that consistently. So if we see some other things come up, that may make some differences. I don't want to hear anything about, <laughs> oh, this makes a difference in my health. Out. Like, no, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. You said it was, you said you might as well just say it's zero over there. What are you, yeah. why, why are you changing it, right? So you're going to have to apply that consistently, Jeff. Yeah, fair enough. I, it's ironic that I'm making the like Joe Rogan, I am very healthy argument for cholesterol, but like in the context of like vaccine hesitancy, I find it absolutely yeah. repulsive. <laughs> even though, even though the same argument, yeah, even though like if you look at it, you look, the, the biggest, you mentioned age, the, the, more of a factor, more a stronger factor the, for getting COVID than being vaccinated is being young. Um, there, it, it's true. A, a bigger risk factor to get COVID, die from COVID, and have all these sorts of problems. To um, die, to die, yeah, yeah, to die. To die. Well, even also, also, I believe it is even to get, but I have to check that up. But to have severe hospital, to have hospitalization, to have not just to die, but severe outcomes. I'm, um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, I, I think that I think that being vaccinated is actually um, a bigger factor than being young when it comes to for, severe outcomes. Uh, but regardless, for like ICU I, admission or vent or or, or a need for mechanical yeah. ventilation. I we, we can. I think we can hospital get, admission. I think just hospital hospitalizations. I think I could be wrong though. So hospitalizations. I, I, oh, yeah. So there's some people who just would would quibble about. How severe of an outcome a hospitalization is depending right. on what country you live in, but 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 so that's why I'm in ICU admission, need for mechanical ventilation. Anyway, point is, <laughs> regardless. The, well, right. well, well, the point yeah. is, is are you running with the vaccine example? Like, I think that we're we're on like it's a, it's a different stratosphere of risk and personal responsibility from my point of view, um, right? And and so I think that when I say might as well round down to zero, what I really mean by that is as a public communicator, I'm not even a public communicator of health, but of, of some sort, um, I don't think it's, I don't think it's worth bringing up. I don't think it's worth mentioning. And I think that that's actually in line with what the American Heart Association is doing in, in their outreach. Like they really do focus on eating a health, or rather a, a heart healthy diet, um, increasing your fiber intake, increasing fruit and vegetable intake, um, watching saturated fat, watching trans fat. I don't think there's a mention of dietary cholesterol. And this is for populations who are at risk of cardiovascular disease. They mention increasing physical activity, stop smoking, and then medical, you know, pharmacological intervention with statins and things like that. There's, there's very little mention of cholesterol. And so when I say round down to zero, I don't mean like from a statistical modeling standpoint, I mean from a public communication standpoint. Um, so I guess if I was to like frame my argument up, it would be more in line with, okay, there may be a risk, uh, in people who are doing all these other risk mitigating activities. Right. Uh, but it's very, very small. Um, and from a practical standpoint, not worth adding to the list, or if it's on the list, uh, it should be below all these other things. Like, I think that's what my, the shape of my argument Ladder is like. more defense, ladder is more defensible. If it, it, it's, I, I do think it should be on the list. Okay, fair enough. Um, I, 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 and the reason I say that is not just like, I'm just saying that, I, it's, I think that's, I can make it, uh, it's, it's based, it's defensible on the basis of the data. Um, and I do, uh, I think it, the, in terms, you mentioned a couple of things about, about guidelines. Yeah, look, it's, it's been controversial. It's only, and I think it's only been really teased out fairly recently. I'm not surprised that guidelines um, are, are taking time to catch up. I think that happens all the time with guidelines, or at least in a, a bunch of the time with guidelines. Um, I think that uh, in, 
the other point to make is that for the average, I, I agree, for a lot of people, for a lot of the public, it's going to be hard enough to get them to cut back on the saturated fat, right? Uh, you know, let alone uh, cut back on dietary cholesterol. So if you had to choose one and, and you're giving a public uh, advice, yes, you, you should say, hey, listen, if you're going to, if you're able to do one, yeah, do that one. Um, however, so it, when you're, however, there's the, this is the important nuance here is that care is individualized. There are people who may not be able to do the d saturated fat, but they are able to cut back on dietary cholesterol. They may not be able to say, listen, okay, look, I, even if I'm going to cut back on dietary cholesterol, I need to get my palm oil butter on my toast. You know, I need to get the nature, right, okay. whatever, like, you know, I, I have, that's at breakfast for me. Okay. I may not. Okay. I'm, I'm either doing it with butter. There's butter going on the toast or, or there's palm oil going on it. Right. It's one of the two, but I will have my toast. Right. Um, or anything like along those lines. Okay. So you, you do what you can. Right. And yes, you try the most impactful things first. And as many of the most important powerful things you can, great. But if you can't do that, yeah, I'm going to go down the list. I'm going to go down the line and say, okay, well, can we try? Can we at least do that then? Or can we at least do that? And if someone is saying, okay, well, you know, at this point, I, this is a change I can make, then that is impactful. And it's, uh, it's not ideal, but it's better than just saying don't change the dietary cholesterol at all. Right. Okay. Fair enough. Um, a couple things there. I, I think. Mm -hmm. One reason I tend to come down on the other side of this, as opposed to, again, a, a similar medical intervention like vaccination, for example, mm -hmm. uh, is that when it comes to diet, there's a weird paradox where I think you can become absolutely and utterly consumed with optimizing your diet for the sake of improving health, improving longevity, until you get to a point where there's nothing left on the menu. And I think it can have some like really negative psychological outcomes as well. Um, and also, I think like the, the, what I tend to preach from a, a like holistic dietary perspective would be a, a more inclusive diet, right? So it's like you know, no mm -hmm. foods are like strictly off the menu. Consume them in moderation. It's okay. Like that. That's the way that I structure my diet, and it's the way I, I recommend eating to other people from both a mental standpoint and from a physiological standpoint. Um, the issue with these types of conversations from my perspective is that they make people afraid of eating foods that, again, mm -hmm. pose such an infinitesimally small risk that your risk actually from being so neurotic about your diet from a mental standpoint, from a, even from a, health, a general health standpoint, because this is very Just complex. Clear, we're, we're, not, sorry, we're not we're not looking at nutrients in isolation. Right. So yeah, that, yeah. that that risk would outweigh the risk that the, the, the small negative risk, if we grant that from eating foods that contain dietary cholesterol and so on and so forth. Like that's a, that's a sidestep, but like I've granted you the first point, right? I've granted you that, okay, there's a, there's a risk, but it's small, right? And it's even smaller than saturated fat, trans fat, smoking, exercise, so on and so forth, right? But it's there, okay. That rest, the, the, then the risk of micromanaging something like this and micromanaging all these factors, which these people who make these arguments, I think, tend to do, unless they're just vegans, which is kind of separate, but you know, they, if, in, in generally speaking, I would argue that the, the the risk imposed by being so obsessed with healthifying every aspect of your life mm -hmm. to try to live as long as, as possible is actually worse than the negative effect of eating a bit more cholesterol or whatever. For some people, that might be true. Um, or uh, so, yeah. So, so if the concern is, well, you know, if are we just going into um, healthifying things to the point of we're just going to be neurotic about everything, um, I would have to do a so I, one thing is I wouldn't say it's infinitesimal. I, I, I don't think it's going to be an infinitesimal. I, would, I think a small risk um, to moderate risk is going to be more accurate. It's not a major risk. I wouldn't say it's an infinitesimal risk. But the question is, are we going to be, start becoming neurotic about uh, small to moderate effect size risks? Um, and they, I think that depends on the person. So there are people who, are, who will do that. There are people who, you're right, they will... Um, they will uh, not just weigh their macros. They will they will do all the every single micro down to crotometer in every detail, and they will be able to do it every day. And they'll graph it out over every you know. There there are people like this. Yes. Um, there are also people who are not like that, who 
have very high baseline risks of cardiovascular disease. And in people who don't have those tendencies, people who are, okay, listen, I can get on top of my diet. I'm, I'm okay with do, making this intervention. I'm okay with doing it. And it's not going to turn me into, it's not going to sacrifice my mental health over becoming hyper anxious or anxiety or OCD over it. Um, and by the way, I have a family history of heart disease. For someone like that, the baseline risk is higher to begin with, even if they're uh, optimizing other things. And for someone like that, it's worth them knowing this. I'm not, right. you know, and so this is where I'm talking about individualized care. Right. It, de it depends who you are. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's Again, I, yeah. I, I actually, have no, I, I, I completely, I completely agree. Um, and you know, this is a matter of perspective, but again, I, I was kind of framing that point in the context of my prototypical viewer who, who tends to be more, a little more health consumed and probably leans more toward the side of unnecessary neuroticism than someone who is like overweight or obese and doesn't care about their health at all, or doesn't take any steps to, to actually improve it, um, at all. Um, so it depends on who your target audience is for, for that kind of message. But I would agree that, yeah, it is, it's important to get the facts right. Of course, it's just a matter of what you're going to emphasize in your, your public outreach. Um, one thing that I notice, uh, in the, in the, in vegan circles is mm -hmm. a lot of emphasis on eggs and cholesterol, like undue emphasis on this point. And, um, I, I think it's undeserved. You know what I mean? Like, that's not a critique towards you. I don't notice you speaking about it a lot, but just in general, it's like people are really freaking out about eggs. I've heard people say the safe amount of eggs is zero. It just doesn't sound right to me. It, it just isn't right. Well, I'm, I'm, if you're, if you, I'm not going to take it. If, I'm not saying you're trying to bait me to defend vegan circles. I, I, most of the people I argue with are probably vegans or other vegans. Mm. Um, so, Vegans say a lot of crazy things. Um, <laughs> keto people say a lot of crazy things. Carnivore people say a lot of crazy things. Omnivores also say a lot of crazy things. Um, you're going to get motivated people from any side of the spectrum for dietary, especially when it comes to ideologies around diets, you're going to get dietary motivated guidance on any side of the aisle. Right. So that doesn't surprise me. Um, I think rather than focusing on what people are, uh, what those types of people are predictably saying, because yeah, they're going to say it. Um, I don't think, I think the broader point is, I don't think I've demonstrated anything uh, indicating that my advice is um, motivated. And even if it is, I don't think I've demonstrated anything that I couldn't defend it against um, uh, someone who uh, is an actor who has spent their whole life in the field. And I'd, ha I'd be happy to do so if anyone disagrees with me. So the point, yeah, yeah I mean, I don't disagree that vegans say crazy things. They do. <laughs> um, but the point is, what I'm saying, what I'm saying here is not crazy. Yeah. No, I don't think it is. I don't, I don't think it is. I think it's perfectly reasonable. Um, again, I'm not so much trying to argue with you on it as I am just trying to like actually get my thoughts straight on the point. Mm -hmm. If it turns out that I'm convinced that the best amount of dietary cholesterol for me is zero and uh, the risk improvement that I would see by taking my cholesterol down to zero would be valuable enough to me in terms of like a longevity or a, a, a life, a, a, you know, health standpoint, then I would, I would consider doing that. Um, but I think from my standpoint, uh, one actually like when it comes to like practical implications like one thing that i don't hear is like getting your cholesterol levels checked you know what i mean like it's like it should like if <laughs> i i don't want to put you into a position that you don't hold but mm -hmm. one thing that i hear a lot is like a lot of noise about like the eggs and you know dietary cholesterol and all this and it's like i think some of these people are pretending to care about people's risk Whereas really they just care about the diet that they're defending. And it's like, if you really cared, yeah, maybe, a, maybe a more straightforward recommendation would be to, uh, get your levels checked. And if you're in a safe, healthy range, then what are you, what are you worried about? Like, you know, that that's the way I see it. Um, well, let me just, let me, so, so to the first point you made, you made two things there. So the first point is that, yeah, of course people care about their 
diets and people, like I said before, you're going to get all sorts of people who care about all sorts of diets and they're going to engage in whatever amount of motivated reason is the diet. So yeah, happy to, happy to grant that. Um, to the second, I don't think that should preclude us from having serious actual discussions about like, a, a, so to the second point, um, uh, yeah, so uh, checking your, yeah, I mean, there's this, yeah, we check, I believe we check lipid panels every three years uh, as part of pre primary preventative care. Um, yeah, I support doing that, <laughs> clearly. Um, <laughs> right. And now, now, but the, the other thing you left in there was that, oh, well, if, if, you're, if, if your lipid levels are okay, then what do you have to worry about? Um, well, if your lipid levels are okay, then you certainly have a lot less to worry about than the, if, if they're not okay. Absolutely. And the, the, but again, individualized care, like the type of people, like let's say the type of person you're talking about, um, on both sides of their family, their uh, father died of a heart attack at the age in their 40s, and their mother died of a heart attack in, the, in, the, in her 50s, right? If they have a strong family history, um, it, is, it might be worth pushing that LDL down further. It depends. Right. Um, and even, you know, it, it depends when we, for different people are going to hit that range of infinitesimally small risk or the risk such that it's so, the benefit is so small, it's not going to outweigh my other values. That's going to happen uh, at different, different people differently, partially because of a difference in values. But the other reason is because of a difference in baseline risk. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's well said. I, I, I think that, that that's perfectly agreeable. Um, I'm still trying to get my thoughts straight on this point in, in terms of how I want to update it for the video, because I think I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable saying, you know, okay, there's this nonlinear relationship in, in describing, you know, the, the impact of uh, dietary cholesterol and blood cholesterol. I think that's a bit of a finer point. I think the take home point from a practical standpoint is, do I need to be worried about eggs? Like, do I need to, like, what do I do with my diet to reduce my risk if I want to do that? And that's where I'm still not really sure because maybe maybe it would be helpful if I just read to you uh, what it is that I had written and um, see if you think it's yeah. Let me just say for, for, for first of all, this idea like, do I need to worry about eggs? Like, this is it's the same thing as any other food that that has certain like. Do I need to be worried about like I okay? Look, I. Uh, my my father had a a heart attack at a fairly uh, young age. I have eaten toast with um, palm oil based butter. I have, I do, I do it. Okay. Do I need to be worried about the palm oil because it has saturated fat? Well, okay. Like what is this question? Do I need to be worried about? Like there, when I eat it, I'm not on, I'm not under any delusions that it's not going to increase my uh, my LDL cholesterol. I'm not going to say like, oh, well, it's not. And I'm also not under any delusions that it's not going to increase my risk. I'm not worried about it because mm -hmm. I have my blood lipids checked and my LDL cholesterol ranges between the 20s and 30s, right? right? Um, it's with, and yes, there, there is some benefit of maybe going from 30, go closer to zero, but that really is for me, the range of infinitesimal benefit that I'm okay with not worrying about it. Okay. And, and, and that's, and that's an approach that everyone is going to take with that individualized component. They're going to say, okay, well, the point is to be able to not be worried about these things without lying to yourself. That's the idea. You don't want to, you don't want to deny reality. But you also don't want to become neurotic and say, okay, so when I eat an impossible burger, I'm not thinking, well, re I, I'm really doing the, you know, I'm super optimizing every part of my outfit. Like, no. Or when I eat a Beyond Burger, I'm like, no, I understand there's saturated fat in there. I understand that, you know, I, that this might, it's, there may be more optimal things to eat. I just don't care. Right. I don't yeah. care because I, uh, yeah, I, I, in this moment, uh, this is what I want to eat. I'm hungry and then I, I enjoy it and I've optimized enough of other things. And my, my actual values are low enough and such that uh, the baseline risk is low enough to, such that it's really that, that it, it is infinitesimal for me. Now, if my values were different, if my, I got a, a different lipid lab and I had uh, an even higher baseline risk or whatnot, and I found out that I had some a, an ApoE, whatever, polymorphism, then you know what? Maybe I would care. Maybe I would worry about it, and I should, right? right. It depends. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I, I think, yeah, we're, we're probably more similar than that. I, I personally find the uh, health and longevity longevity space 
a bit cringe honestly because it's like a lot of mechanistic speculation and yeah. just a lot of hyper obsession over living a couple years longer when it's like ah there are certain activities and you know things i'm gonna i want to do in my life even if uh, okay it's gonna take a, a couple weeks off the the end there it's like i'd rather live a, a more fulfilling life in my best yeah. years, if you will. That's kind of the, it's obviously. I agree that that happens a hundred percent. I've yeah. seen it. You've seen it. I agree that it happens. What I would, the only thing I'll say is don't let that, don't let that observation get in the, the way of find, uh, get in the way of um, giving the wrong guidance to someone who really does have very high baseline risks, right. who really does have, and who really would benefit yeah, for fair going down the line of optimization. Yeah. yeah. All right. So this is really, really rough, but um, is there anything here that sounds off base to you? Um, okay. So yada, yada, uh, dietary cholesterol does increase uh, uh, blood cholesterol. I, I described the relationship as we've done. Um, generally, this comes back to a discussion about meat and eggs usually eggs. I personally still eat eggs, not as much as I used to. I usually just have one whole egg uh, in the morning these days. Um, this might put me at a slightly increased risk of developing heart disease later in life, but I'm honestly not worried about it myself because I'm very active. I eat a healthy, inclusive diet overall that includes fruits, berries, and vegetables, and I maintain a healthy body weight. I don't smoke, whatever. Uh, all those things seriously mitigate my risk. Are they enough to completely offset the impact of dietary cholesterol? I'm not sure but I haven't found evidence scary enough from a personal perspective to modify my diet further. Um, and uh, that's about it. Um, does that sound like wrong to you in any way? I don't think you've said anything false. Um, this idea that, this idea that um, of doing all these factors to offset this risk of dietary cholesterol, it's like, I'm trying to put that in any other context, like you, you, I mean, you can say that it's just that the way the, I think the more refined way of saying it is just that because my baseline risk is so low to begin with, because of my, I don't know your family history, uh, but if because of, uh, because of my physical activity, because of my baseline blood, uh, lipid panel or blood values, because of my, um, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm, I'm, I'm fit. Uh, because of all of these things, my baseline uh, risk is so low that um, a, a small to moderate effect size, uh, if that is the case, um, it's not something I'd be that worried about. Like that's mm. that's the that's the refined way of saying it. I, right, I don't want right. people to try to like say, OK, well, I'm going to do this and offset it with some cardio and do that. Like, it's like, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah, no, that's right. And like I said, yeah, that was kind of rough, but I think, I think that's like my, my tone of it currently. Whereas I think maybe three or four years ago, I might've been like, this is nothing YOLO. If, if it's your macros, like, I, th I think I can do a little yeah. bit better than that. Um, but okay. I, I, uh, I, I wish, see this, this is the thing that bothers me about this issue is that, mm. I wish there was more consensus. You know what I mean? Like on most health and fitness topics, you can get a panel of 10 or so people and, and their, their opinions converge quite strongly. Mm -hmm. On this, I, I don't find it to be the case. At least the tones are so wildly disparate. Um, and it tends to be split down vegan, non-vegan lines, which is curious. Like you're a vegan, I feel like, yeah, although your, your stance is extremely reasonable and, and agreeable, like, you, you do come down more on the side of cholesterol being a nutrient of concern, even if mild compared to saturated fat and others. Mm -hmm. But there are, you know, people who eat meat, who are smart, who, who yeah, aren't so worried about it. So that, mm -hmm. that's, I find that difficult from like my tr trying to like capture my own understanding of this area is like, I can't, find any real like consistency or authority that is like gives a very clear answer on this topic you know yeah well i think there's a number of reasons for that um imagine imagine a consistent authority trying to convey to the public or the conversation that we just had uh to people who are not educated in science um that would be difficult let alone the fact that this is a recent development 
uh, in science that this has been sorted out. Now, now looking back with, with hindsight, mm -hmm. it's like, well, why didn't we figure this out to begin with? Like, didn't anyone, and in fact, an argument could be made that it may have been figured out decades ago um, in an ignored Hopkins 1992 paper to some degree. It's debatable. Um, but hindsight is always 2020. And for better or for worse, the most robust data that has really put the nail in the coffin here about there being a relationship is really recent data. Yeah. Um, 2020, 2019. Um, this isn't something that's you know, guidelines are updated every five years for many, for, for, for five, for some organizations, five years, some organizations, 10 years. It's, I mean, <laughs> it, it, and you're in the, you're in the vortex of this heated ideolo ideological uh, debate over, you know, people who, you know, researchers included who fight for a given diet. Right. Um, and not, I'm now I'm not saying it's unresolvable. There, there. I'm just saying I wouldn't expect there to be a consensus right now, even if uh, one side is right over the other. And I do think one side is right over the other, uh, very, uh, very clearly. Um, I guess the one thing I can say is that I, the, well, really the only thing I can I can say a couple of things. I can say that I think uh, cardiologists who are um, well, I, I think the most I think the most consistent thing I can say, the most uh, defensible thing I can say is just that if anyone does disagree with me, um, I am happy to have a discussion with them and I'm happy to um, explain my view and explain the reasons for it. And I have a very provided that they're good faith and provided that they're able to hear, hear what I say and, and look at the data. Um, I have a very high confidence that they will be on come over come over to my side and if they don't they would not be able to defend uh a view that disagrees with mine on this right um quickly on eggs specifically the american heart association still recommends one mm -hmm. egg a day as part of a heart healthy diet if you will do you disagree with that or do you think that's good well when you say recommend one egg a day do you uh, um let's read let's 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 read the actual um, um yeah, send me the actual quote here Yep. So this is from 2015. Uh, today, the American Heart Association issued a new science advisory on the dietary cholesterol and cholesterol risk, confirming where the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, Committee landed in 2015. Dietary cholesterol is not a nutrient of concern, and eggs can be a part of a healthy diet. Um, in healthy individuals, consumption of an egg a day is acceptable in heart-healthy dietary patterns. Uh, in older, healthy individuals, consumption of up to two eggs per day is accessible within a heart-healthy dietary plan. Um, man, there you go. Yeah. So from the 2015, this is back in the... Um, By the way, sorry, yeah, yeah. this was published January 7th, 2020 uh, on the H... Oh, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. okay so <laughs> wait was it was just it? Wait, wait, just wait, wait, just to be clear i'm going to text you the link um yeah, text me the so, link. Th so this is actually uh, they're citing the american heart association but this is actually a a blog um so oh a blog. yeah okay yeah, yeah, yeah. okay but this is, so, not, so, but, but, so, so this is not important. directly from the the horse's mouth but it's uh no but it's important yeah, we get the horse it's, it's yeah, important we yeah, get yeah, the yeah, horse yeah, and let's not do a blog let's do it let's do it let's do it um Okay, so heart.org. <laughs> they even had the uh, mm -hmm. the color scheme and formatting of the site yeah. the same as the because it, it reminds because the non the non nutrient of concern that is that was um, that was a change that was made in guidelines back in 2015 right uh, when right. all this confusion was still happening and that they backed off that by the way but if you right. look at New guidelines. Yeah. They don't that that was why uh, when I read that I was like, wait, this isn't the same site that I was, uh, or the same page that, that I was. That phrase, I will tell you that that phrase was deleted from the guidelines. Right, right, the, right, right, right. Concern. Um, okay, let's find the egg. Yeah. So okay, this is on heart.org. Uh, it's published August uh, twenty eighteen. So if you want to throw it out right away, you can. But um, 
says, I can give you something. From it says the American Heart like. Association suggests one egg per day for people who eat them as part of a healthy diet. Okay, um, so for people who eat them as part of a, for people who, okay, so notice the latter part there. Right. Um, so yeah, they're not saying you, you, you know, if you want to have a healthy diet, you ought to eat one egg a day. <laughs> uh, they are saying, right. they are saying that uh, to, you know, you can you can have a, a egg per day uh, as part of a health, heart healthy diet. And again, going back to everything we were saying before. As part of a heart healthy diet is a very important part of that statement. Right. You know, if you are again, if you're optimizing a whole other things, and if you if you're hab habitually associated to eating it an egg, and that's what's you know, that's what's helping you have this heart healthy uh, diet. And if you didn't have an egg, then you wouldn't have a heart healthy diet for other reasons and other dietary factors come into play. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. You know, that's more, but that's not the same thing as saying that um, you know there isn't a context. Uh, or in a common enough context where uh, an egg a day wouldn't, uh, it, 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 there, there wouldn't be a context where removing with that one egg a day wouldn't be appropriate. Um, that's not, those, those two statements are both compatible. Uh, or at least one doesn't entail, uh, sorry, one doesn't entail the other rather. Um, I would still like to see more up to date uh, than 2018 because again, the, the, the Maki meta regression was published in uh, 2019, 2020, I believe, maybe, maybe early available in 2018. Right. Um, okay. Fair. Um, yeah, I, I would have to do a bit of digging on the, the site here or see if there was like a more updated position stand or, or, or what have you, but, um, uh, except I still, so, 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 so here's so, what they say in healthy individual consumption of an agate is acceptable. Okay. Okay. Um, in healthy at least from what okay. I'm reading. Yeah. Okay. So, so you're saying so, like, it, it, you know, if, if you were to, you know, uh, comment on these guidelines, like, you would suggest that, yeah, I mean, removing that egg in some people would actually be better and lower their risk. Like, it's a good idea to do that. Yeah, and if, well, I think I think removing the egg uh, would reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease. The degree to which it does so is going to be dependent on the baseline risk factors. Right. And yeah, for some yeah. people, with some people, some people. I don't think anything. And by the way, I don't think any of the writers of that guideline would disagree with me. Yeah. I don't no, think a single think one is fair. important. No, I think that's fair. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. I, I just think oh, there's a lot of fear mongering about eggs in populations, again, of people who are already taking care of their health. Um, so again, it depends on who your target audience is for that recommendation. Um, but again, yeah. I'm speaking to generally healthy people for the most part, I imagine. I don't know what, you know, two, three million people the one, look the like caveat exactly. for you, The caveat <laughs> for you would be for your audience that would also be for people who are healthy, but they have a high baseline genetic risk of heart disease. Right, right. That, fair, that would be fair. that. That those would be, and you do have those. I'm sure you do. Have, you have those. Of course. In your yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, okay, I think that that helped me wrap my head around it. I think what I might do is uh, follow up with you on mm -hmm. um, getting some of those more. I mean, I can. I'm sure I can find them myself. But if if you wouldn't mind sending some of that over, yeah. and I can um, I can link some of that in the. Uh, description box and show notes for, for people who are, are, are still around. Um, but yeah, it was really great ch chatting with you, man. I, 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 like, I can tell you're, you, you make your points very well, which I appreciate. Like it's your thought process is very organized, which I like, because I find a lot of people who speak on this topic get really down in the weeds and they don't form their arguments clearly. So it's like, we're not even getting at what it is I'm asking you yet. Like, can we just hit it head on? Yeah. I find that like, you do that really well, which is great. Um, and yeah, I'd, I'd love to talk to you more generally about veganism. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've been interested in like the ethics of it for a really, really long time and find them pr pretty much like utterly convincing, but have just not been able to actually yeah. make the behavioral change in my personal life because of my career and yeah. I don't know, cognitive dissonance. <laughs> um, so uh, I yeah. don't know. I, I think it would be cool to chat with you about that maybe more broadly uh, at some point. Um, I'm personally really excited about synthetic meats. Um, I feel like that m might be what finally gets me over the hump. I think it's what's going to be gets a lot of people over the hump. I think the, I think um, the world will be a vegan world um, in virtue of uh, animal products being obsolete. Um, yeah. In the same way, um, people are, horse and buggies are basically not a thing anymore. Very rarely, yeah. um, 
not because of any ethical decision, but because it just looks really stupid to travel from one state to another in a horse and a buggy when you could take a car. Yeah. Um, that's kind of where I envision um, the world going in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how many years off would you guess uh, the, the commercial availability is? I think it will be, oh, commercial availability is already a, a thing in some some locations. In Singapore, you can get, uh, you can go there right now and buy a lab made chicken meat. Uh, yeah. In, that's so, awesome so it, i love it's that coming. yeah it's, <laughs> it, it, it's coming it's already it's already there for for, for some countries super um, expensive though from what i've heard the nuggets i mean they're expensive for nuggets but they're not like they're not going to break your bank okay um right. i'm, I'm they're, thinking they're, in like america in like north america when, when are we going to get price it? is also dropping precipitously i would expect definitely i definitely think it's going to be within the next 10 years maybe within the next five years um and I think within the next 30 years, you're going to see um, what you're going to see is you're going to see, I, I think in the next 30 years, it'll be a very mainstream uh, type of food. And you'll have the same type of debate between like the naturalists or bad organic food and conventional. You'll see like the same type. I think that's where the conversation will go. You'll have like these holdouts where no natural meat. This is the way it was supposed to be. Right. Um, Right. You know, whoa, what are you doing with this sterile lab? Don't you want the the, the, the animal dragging its own piss and shit for its life? Don't you want <laughs> that type of meat? Like, you know, come, like. Yeah. yeah, there's a um, there's. Yeah, that's the really interesting. I think there's like an element of um, like uncanny valley creepiness for people uh, when it comes to synthetic meats. It's like, yeah. oh, it was cooked up in a lab. It's like. No, the factory farms are way more fucking repulsive. Yes. Like, <laughs> but uh, yeah, okay, that's that's cool. Um, how do you think the vegan community will adopt that? Because I feel like there are some like vegan purists who still might argue that uh, you know synthetic meats are still animal flesh or something. I don't know how those arguments would go, but I, I'm yeah, skeptical but... that the community would be quick to adopt it. So it depends on which vegan community you're talking about. Are the vegan community that I come from um would embrace it wholeheartedly um i think and i my intuition tells me that most vegans would embrace it wholeheartedly there is a a hold out among vegans that are again ideological and they're insane on my view um and i think that um the vegan community would be better off without them to be honest i i think that they do more harm than good um, and I think that their views will, um, die with them. I think that, the, I think that technology has a way of progressing yeah. regardless of whether you like it or not. Yeah. Uh, it's always been, <laughs> been that way. And That's will, super dark. Yeah. Their views will die with them. Yeah. It's yeah. fair though. No, yeah. 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 Um, and, and the rest of the world will move on. Yeah. 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 All right. Well, uh, I think that's all that I had for you. It was really good chatting with you, man. I hope we can do it again yeah, sure. some other time. I appreciate all your insight. Absolutely. And um, yeah, we'll talk soon. For sure. All right. All right. Take care, Jeff. Bye-bye.